Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his timely series, The Truth in Love. Today, he'll explore what God declares about gender, marriage, and sex in an essential lesson for our world today called Boy Meets Girl. Now, what we have said in this sermon series, the truth in love, that truth is like a guardrail. Truth is a good thing. Truth keeps you on the road. And if you go off the road, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the Bible says. Uh, God has grace and his love and his mercy is there. And so uh, we can go and, and get help from God. But the point of life is not to keep falling off the cliff and there is love in truth, and there is truth in love, and both of these are inseparably linked. Now, we're going to talk about some things today that 20 years ago, no one would have thought twice about. We're going to talk about love and marriage and, and sexual intimacy in marriage, and we're going to talk about uh, the sexes. Nobody, 20 years ago, it'd be like, yeah, we all know that, we all believe that. But today, the things that I'm going to share are going to be controversial out in the world. They may be controversial to some of you in this audience. But it is my command from God to speak the truth in love. And so I want to put up some guardrails today. And if you say, man, that sounds harsh, it's because I don't want you to fall off the cliff. And so we want to speak the truth in love. I've entitled this message today, Boy Meets Girl. Hey, what does God say about gender, about marriage, and about sexual intimacy? Genesis chapter 1, I'll begin reading in verse 26. This is day six of creation. And the Bible says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. God is one, but he's Three persons in one God. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The Trinity, the Godhead, is speaking together in conference. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Truth number one, foundational truth number one, God made two sexes, male and female. Male and female. Now, as the Lord is creating... In the six days of creation, and those are six days of creation, 24-hour days of creation. Some people don't believe that. Some people in seminary don't believe that. But it's clear from the Word of God. Anybody who reads the Bible and takes it at face value would say, well, God is talking about uh, 24-hour days. And there was evening and there was morning the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. So God, when he sets up, he creates plants, he creates animals, he creates people, and they're male and female. And they have to be male and female so that they can do what? Be fruitful and multiply. That's just the way God set it up. 
And so in Genesis chapter 1, we get an overview of what God did. And it says on day 6 that man is the crown of his creation. And then in Genesis chapter 2, we don't have another creation. We just have a zeroing in on, okay, let me tell you further how God made man and how God made woman. They're both made on the sixth day, but they're not made at the same time. But in Genesis 1.27, we read that God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Two sexes, male and female, and both are made in the image of God. Just two, male and female. And it's so critical to know this. When God created man, male and female created them, their biological sex can never be changed. When God created Adam, he's a man that can never be changed. He created Eve, a woman that can never be changed. And when he creates today in terms of giving life, when a man and woman come together under the confines of marriage and have a baby, when does life begin? Life begins at conception. When does does the uh, sex get assigned? When that baby is conceived, and that comes from God. God determines if that's going to be a boy or a girl. I ran across a couple of quotes from different uh, professors and doctors. I thought they were very interesting. This one is from Dr. Lawrence Mayer. He's a psychiatrist and a mathematician. He's got a PhD in mathematics. He said this, scientifically speaking, transgender men are not biological men and transgender women are not biological women. The claims to the contrary are not supported by a scintilla of scientific evidence. Professor Robert P. George says this, changing sexes is a metaphysical impossibility because it is a biological impossibility. When God creates you in the womb before you were born, as he told Jeremiah, I I formed you in the womb. I knew you before you were born. And says in Psalm 139, I weaved you together, your innermost parts. When, when there was none of them, when you weren't uh, around yet for anyone to see, I was knitting you together. I was putting you together. Paul McHugh, Dr. Paul McHugh, who's chief of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins, or he was, he wrote a, a paper talking about uh, sexuality and, and gender and those kinds of things. Man, that came out a few years ago. The LBGT community freaked out. They were so upset that this guy would say what he said. And they tried to get Johns Hopkins to squash that study. And Paul McHugh said in defense, he said, I'm not against transgender people. I want them to get the help they need. It's psychiatric, not surgical. The scripture says in Romans chapter 9, the thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Now, we know that in pottery. You're not going to have the the thing molded. Say to the molder, say to the potter, hey, I don't want you to make me a, a cup. I wanted to be a dish. You made me a pitcher, and I wanted to be a bowl. It doesn't do that. Yet we do that to God. And we are saying to God today, Lord, you made a mistake in the way you created me in the womb. And I may be a biological male, but I was supposed to be a female. Ezekiel chapter 18, the Lord chides Israel because they were saying to God, yet the way of the Lord is not right. And God says, is my way not right? No, it's your way that is not right. So we have a society today that's saying, let's take down this guardrail because people need to know that, hey, you choose. When you get old enough, you choose. You're going to be in, in, a, in a progressive home. You're raised as gender neutral. And then when you get old enough, five, six, seven, eight, whatever it is, then you choose what you want to be. God chooses what you are. So God made two sexes, male and female. And like I said, hey, 20, 30 years ago, everybody's like, yep, 
I had no argument here. But now we're arguing about this that should be so plain. Second foundational truth. God made two sexes to correspond to each other. So it says in Genesis chapter 2, as, it, as God gives us a clearer picture to what, as to what he did, he says in Genesis chapter 2, then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then God planted a garden in Eden, and he put the man in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. And he says in verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now that's amazing. Because in Genesis chapter 1, we read five times where God says he would create, and God saw that it was good. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. Five times. Now all of a sudden we hear, it's not good. How can it not be good? Here's a perfect man, Adam, in a perfect place, the Garden of Eden, in relationship with a perfect God. I mean, it should not just be good, it should be great, it should be perfect. But God says it's not good. For the man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper suitable to him. One who corresponds to him. And verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. And every bird of the sky. And brought them to, him, to man to see what he would call them. And what the, whatever the man called a living creature. That was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle. And to the birds of the sky. And to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. God made Adam with an unmet need. Adam was alone. But Adam didn't realize he was alone. So God wanted to show to Adam that he had a need for a helper suitable to him. And God created in Adam's heart this longing for Mrs. Adam. He showed Adam his need for Eve. And then God created Eve for Adam, similar but different from him. And it says in verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he, then he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man and the man said at last this is it this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man he sees Eve wow she is incredible she is different from me but she's like me. She's my counterpart. She corresponds to me. And that's what the Lord said. I will make a helper suitable, one that corresponds to him, one that is uh, a, a parallel to him, one that fits him like a glove. And God created Eve to be similar but different from Adam. Now, notice how different they are. You know, in our uh, social engineering, we try and say there's no difference between a boy or a girl. Baloney. There's a huge difference between a boy or a girl. I mean, the obvious is there. Their, their physiology is different. But there's tons of other differences, and we see it in creation. See, God created Adam and formed Adam from red dirt. Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, a living soul. How did God, what did he use? He used lifeless dirt to make mad, a, a man, to make ish. And the name Adam literally means red. That was his name. God named him Red. You know, sometimes we use that as a nickname. Oh, there, there's a Red so-and-so, you know. Uh, that's, that sometimes it's a name. Red Fox was his name, but oftentimes Red is a nickname. Well, that was Adam's name, nickname Red, because he was from red dirt. Eve is not made from the dust of the ground. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he 
performed the first surgery, and he took from Adam's side. It says rib, but it, it's more than just a rib because Adam says she's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. God took from Adam's side this bone and this flesh, and he fashioned this creature called Eve, called woman, called Isha. Now, Adam was formed. That word in the Hebrew, formed, yatzer, it means to squeeze into shape, to form, to mold, to press. It's the picture of manufacturing. You know, you see some of these how it's made thing, and you watch how this is a manufacturing plant. It's just, just pressing it out, just manufacturing it. That's how Adam was made. Eve wasn't manufactured. She wasn't formed. She was fashioned, literally built. God took the uh, bone and the flesh and from Adam in surgery, and then he went off into his workshop, and he fashioned and built and sculpted this Isha. She's amazing. And it, it, it's a totally different thing because she's made of flesh and bone. He's made of dirt. You think about how different men and women are. You know, a man's brain, the way it works, left side versus right side, and just the way it operates, is so very different from a woman. A man thinks in compartments. A man can compartmentalize. So a man's brain is a lot like a waffle. It's just got these little boxes, right? And so he's just in this little box. So he leaves the house in the morning, and he leaves the home box and goes to the work box. And his wife will say to him at the end of the day, Honey, did you think about me today? He's like, hmm. I was in a different box. I, had, I was in this other box. I'm sorry. I you know, and it, what does he do? He, I, I think I must have. But, but he really didn't because he's in, this, he's in the zone. We talk about being in the zone. Is in the zone is in the box. A woman doesn't have a waffle for a brain. Her brain is like a plate of spaghetti. It's just... <laughs> Everything is connected in a, in a woman's, the way a woman thinks and feels. We're just different, and that's a good thing. And see, God made us different to bring us together as one. How weird would it be if you had a right hand on your right arm and a right hand on your left arm? Be like, hey, it's not supposed to be like that. Something's up with this, you know? Uh, so we have hands that, that God made them to fit together. And that's the way he did when he created male and female. God made two sexes to correspond to each other. And truth number three, God made two sexes to marry, multiply, and enjoy oneness. So the Lord brings Isha to Adam. And he is thrilled. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. And then God gives a statement about marriage. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and, they sh and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now let's talk about some guardrail truth. Truth in love and love in truth. Marriage is defined by God as an institution between the man and the woman. Men and women get married, and no one else does. It's reserved for a man and a woman. Now, I don't care what the Supreme Court of the United States of America will say and rule on. That's God's definition of marriage. Anything else ain't marriage. Because God says what marriage is. It's between a man and a woman. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And marriage is the only place for legitimate sexual relations. Not outside of marriage. You're not married and you're sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend? What do we call that? God calls it fornication. God says don't do that. You're married and you're sleeping with somebody else? What does God say about that? God says that's adultery. Don't do that. 
Let the marriage bed, Hebrews 13, verse 4, let the marriage bed be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, those who have sex before they're married, those who have sex outside of their marriage, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now, if we don't fear God, then we don't care. And we just blow over the, the guardrail and we say, who cares about that? We're going to do whatever we want to do. There's a reason why God put the guardrail there. And hey, praise the Lord, if you mess up, if you go over the cliff, there's grace to help and to pick up the pieces. But hey, don't we all agree it's so much better to not go over the cliff? I mean, why do you want to say, well, God has grace, so I'm going to go over the cliff? Yeah, but you're going to have scars from that. There, there's a price. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this will also reap. For the one who sows to the flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Marriage is reserved for a man and a woman. Marriage is the only place for legitimate sexual ex expression. And marriage is a beautiful thing when you do it God's way. When you do marriage the way God set it up, when you follow the blueprints and go and, uh, and follow the directions and do marriage God's way, marriage is a beautiful thing. Now, what is God's way? The husband has a job and a role to play in marriage, and the wife has a job and a role to play in marriage. And the husband's main job in marriage is to love his wife, to nourish his wife, to cherish his wife, to protect his wife. That's his job. Before God, husbands, love your wives. Nourish them, cherish them. Now, her job, I like talking about her job. Uh, her job and all the wives' job, your job is to respect your husband and help him. See, I will make a helper suitable to you. See, when a man does his job and a woman does her job, the result is oneness and openness and fulfillment in marriage. The man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. They were naked. There was openness. There were no secrets. Talk to couples who are in trouble. They have secrets. You know what's so wonderful about marriage? See, God designed it to be a place where there's intimacy, where your spouse can know everything about you. She can know you thoroughly and still love you intimately. And God wants there to be oneness like that. The world can't understand that. The world can't have that. The world can't know that. Psalm 127, 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And so you and I have a choice. We can go our way or we can go God's way. We can say with the people in Ezekiel chapter 18, the way of the Lord is not right. I'm going to go my way. And God says, you know where your way leads? Your way leads every single time to the pigsty. If you don't believe me, just ask the prodigal son. Where did he end up? The pigsty. There might be some thrills and chills along the way, but it will lead to the pigsty. God's way leads to life eternal. It leads to love and joy and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. self, and, and self Against such things, there is no law. So here's the question. Which way are you going to go? We're talking about the truth in love, and here's the truth. God loves you, and he wants to have a personal relationship with you. If you're not sure you have this relationship, today's the day to pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior. I trust you and I give my life to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. 
please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's single message, Boy Meets Girl, is available on CD, DVD, USB flash drive, or as an MP3 download when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. God has called you and me to speak the truth in love to our lost and dying world. In fact, the Lord commanded it. But how can we declare God's truth about sin and still effectively demonstrate His love? Now in my timely series called The Truth in Love, I explain the moral guardrails that God has put in place to protect us from harm. The series contains seven important lessons to help establish you firmly in God's truth and equip you to actively and boldly share His truth in the rapidly changing world in which we live. It's also my gift to thank you for your support this month to help from his heart share the truth and love around the world. So please request your copy of the Truth and Love series when you respond today. Now remember, together we're helping people discover who Jesus really is by sharing the truth of Scripture in the love of Christ. God bless you. For your gift of any amount from his heart this month, we'd like to say thank you by sending you Pastor Jeff's essential and timely seven-message series, The Truth in Love. You can get it on CDs, DVDs, a USB flash drive, or an immediate MP3 download. Simply call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org to invest in kingdom work through From His Heart and learn why and how to speak the truth in love to a lost and dying world. And thank you for watching From His Heart today, the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.